All right, today we welcome Dr. Sarah Bergamy, a clinical psychologist and founder of an active private practice in Denver called Phoenix Rise, which specializes in offerings in identity development, sexual minority competency, as well as transgender and gender variant issues with adults, adolescents, and children. Her practice welcomes those struggling with these challenges. She is a senior clinical instructor at CU's Anschutz Medical School in the psychiatry department, as well as a psychologist in the True Center for Gender Diversity at Children's Hospital. I had to look this up. The acronym TRUE stands for Trust, Respect, Understand, and Emerge. Dr. Bergamy has previously taught classes as an adjunct assistant professor at DU's Doctor of Psychology program and the International Disaster Psychology Master's program focused on areas of development and culture, LGBTIQQ cultural competency, and cross-cultural analysis. She is the current Colorado representative to the American Psychological Association Council of Representatives, which is the APA, and chair of the APA Committee on Sexual Orientation and Gender Diversity. She has previously served as the Diversity Division Chair of the Colorado Psychological Association. Dr. Bergamy has been a member of the Board of Directors for Urban Peak, which is a nonprofit organization in Colorado serving youth experiencing homelessness or those at risk of becoming homeless since 2008. We are honored to have you share your wisdom with us. Today, Dr. Bergamy, welcome. Thank you. I'm on, I think. Give me just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and get my slides up and running for you. I just want to make sure we tech this right. I, I'm actually an analog person living in a digital world. Um, so I don't know if we just change our feed over. That's probably going to, there we are. Um, I always actually start to feel extremely tired when I start hearing my own bio. Um, it, it like reminds me why I am so tired, which is validating, um, albeit it's a little moment of being dismayed where I realize, oh, I really, I really do work too much. Um, in any event, thank you very much for having me today. I'm sort of a, a movement-oriented person, so this is going to be a little bit of a challenge for me to stay in the light. So I'll apologize in advance. If I start moving around and I go into the shadows, I promise I'll come back to the light. Um, I'm going to breeze through this because we already belabored that I work too much and just kind of jump right here. Um, I sort of, see, here I go. <laughs> I sort of, in a way, I always say I accidentally ended up in my arena of specialization. I mean, it's not truly an accident, but truth be told, I, I thought I was going to be an Olympic swimmer. That's really where I thought. I thought I'd be in front of you today showing you my gold medals. Um, that didn't happen. Surprise. Turns out that's uh, statistically not a very common thing that happens for folks. But, and making a living off of being on a Wheaties box turns out not to be open to everybody. Um, <laughs> So I went into psychology. Well, before I went into psychology, and in fact, I was in college at the time that this magazine cover came out. Um, I was just a first year student. Uh, then I might have been a second year at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. I'm born and raised in Denver, Colorado. Um, that was quite the departure for me, uh, kind of a whole new world. And the significance of this cover um, I, I really, there's a reason I start with it. I can't, I can't sort of emphasize enough that this probably had a lot to do with why I'm standing in front of you today with the general competency areas that I exercise in my professional life. Anybody real quick? Who's this? <laughs> Ellen. We don't have a lot of trouble with that one. I'm going to ask you, though, I mean, does this look a little bit like a different version of Ellen than we're used to seeing now? I mean, the loafers are not where it's at, right? She's all about the tennies. We're, we're into sneakers now. Why was this cover, though, the least bit significant? I mean, nowadays, if you saw this on a cover and you're in the grocery aisle and you're checking out, I'm actually going to guess most of us wouldn't really look twice. Like, OK, Ellen's gay, got it. You know, is there a special on prime rib? Because I'm having a lot of people from you know, dinner, and I, I need to get out of here. But in 1997, this was incredibly significant. Does anybody recall what happened? Ellen had a, a sitcom. What occurred after she was on the cover of Time? Her show was canceled. 
Now, was it canceled just because nobody really liked a show about a book owner, bookstore owner and people were like, oh, down with bookstore owners? Why was it canceled? It made it about one more season. Anybody know how we support? I know any more people are like, TV, what's TV? We all stream things. I still have cable. Um, I like network television. I also have things called newspapers in my house. Um, but how do you support a television program? Commercials, right, commercial dollars. Well, so what happened was Ellen comes out of the closet and we start having advertisers pull out like crazy. They did not want to be affiliated with an out lesbian woman. A little bit of a different take. <laughs> What's Ellen up to nowadays? She has a show again. She talks about anything and everything, invites people on dances, and gives away a lot of stuff from advertisers. I find some irony in this. Um, I just bring this up to start the conversation because, in essence, this is a really nice illustration of sort of what's happened sociologically over time concerning something like sexual orientation identity. Moving quickly through some other slides, just wanted to give you an idea. I like magazine covers as a way of kind of marking the time of what's happening in sociocultural history. In 2013, Jason Collins was the first out NBA basketball star. Um, I enjoyed his quote because he said, you know, I wish I wasn't the kid in the classroom raising his hand and saying I'm different. If I had my way, someone else would have already done this. Nobody has, which is why I'm raising my hand. Now, it's not that nobody else has ever come out of the closet as being a gay man. But in the hypermasculine world of professional sports, nobody had in 2013. Real quick reminder for those of you who are not as strong in math, my, my math is a little rusty these days. We're, we're talking all of a good six years ago. Six years. So it's not ancient history. Nowadays, we're moving much more into the realm also of gender. Gender seems to be the thing that's exploded on the scene. People are like, never mind sexual orientation. Gender identity is absolutely where people are <clears throat> more focused than ever before. So cover of National Geographic, cover of Time, this is Laverne Cox. She's a model, she's an actress, she's transgender. Cover of Time, this is an article, it was called Beyond He or She, and it had to do with non-binary gender identities. So moving out of the, con the concept that people are only men or women, girls and boys. These are not you know, small magazine titles. I'm not talking about club newsletters. I'm not talking about interest groups. These are mainstream, large-scale magazines. This is not a large-scale magazine. This is a publication of the Human Rights Campaign. The reason I put it up here is I think this frames really nicely some things I'm going to spend some time on. So Jaden Laredo is a young person in high school in very, very southern Texas. When it came time to take pictures for the yearbook, they pretty well offered the kids two outfits. But of course, it was stratified based on gender. Jaden is what I would call an assigned female at birth person. Many people will think of this as born female. My language is particular on purpose. I'm a clinical psychologist. We speak in phenomenology. I'm a scientist. I don't speak in labels as much as I actually speak in the things that are happening. And as I'm going to kind of speak about today, part of the things that we do in day-to-day -day life is we tell people kind of who they are categorically. We do it exceptionally early. When it comes to sex, we do it before people even arrive breathing on the earth. Jaden, assigned female at birth, was given basically the option to wear these kind of smock things. Anybody ever wear the little smock you put over your head, especially ladies in the room? You might have been given, it was like a little, you could wear anything, because it really just kind of went over your clothes. And they took a picture, and everybody looked uniform from here up. Just one color, kind of draped. Well, the interesting thing to me was it wasn't that all the students were told to wear that for yearbook pictures. It was just the girls. The guys were actually told to dress formal. <laughs> I was like, wow. I think if I were a guy at that time, I'd, I'd also be like, I don't want to wear all this cumbersome material. But Jaden actually asked, can I take another photo? And can I do that in a tuxedo? And you know, the camera person for the yearbook said, that's fine. We can do that. But then when they got the pictures back, Jaden said, that's the picture I want in the yearbook. And the school district said, absolutely not. And so they sued. They had to sue to the point where finally the school district said, okay, fine. 
You can have your tuxedo picture in the yearbook. I bring that up because, again, it's interesting to me that it had to go to the point of litigation for a photo with certain clothing. Now, this is not the most foreign concept in the world. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, which are credited of kicking off the LGBTQ+, plus, this acronym has gotten very long, uh, rights movement. And at that time, in 1969, in June, which is why we celebrate Pride in June, there was a municipal code in New York City that said people should always have on three pieces of gender-appropriate clothing, and if you broke that code, you could be arrested. That's 1969. This, this we're moving into the 21st century. More magazine covers. This might be familiar, 1976, and I bring this up, Bruce Jenner, most people recognize Bruce Jenner. Pretty phenomenal athlete. And then Vanity Fair in 2015. I actually bring up Caitlyn Jenner not because I'm here to promote Caitlyn. You don't have to like Caitlyn. You don't have to like Bruce. But the point is this was probably the first time that across generations people became aware on a large scale that people did not always identify with the gender they were given at birth. It's more striking probably to people after knowing somebody for a very long time into adulthood when this happens, which is why this generated a lot of attention. Okay, so to really just muddy the waters, because that's what I do best. <laughs> I mentioned the, the unwieldy acronym LGBTQ+. As you can see, I've thrown some more terms up here. This is actually my time pitfall when I speak to groups. I could get stuck on this slide for easily the entire time we are here, so I'm not going to, I promise. But what I wanted to bring up is usually acronyms come into our existence because they're meant to simplify things. Right? Is it working? Does anybody feel like this has simplified and made it easier to understand the letters in this acronym? I mean, show of hands, are you like, this is so clear. I, obviously, that's loaded. I expect you to not raise your hand. It's not clear. It's confusing. Furthermore, it is a bunch of things together that are actually not even the same concept. So we have sexual orientations. We have gender identities. We have sex identities. We have sexuality orientations. I could go on. I didn't even include things like relational orientation, affectional orientation anymore. The language, especially of young people, has moved to broaden the way that we think of ourselves in these arenas. And most of us, I will say most of us who are of an adult age, are pretty confused. <laughs> and we come by it honestly. When you just keep adding letters onto something, but you can't quite break it down and make it simpler, people sort of get befuddled. And when you put it all together in one thing, you think they're all the same. So this is what I call my get you off the hook slide. <laughs> it's not your fault if you're confused. So if there's one thing I could bring you today, maybe there's a little relief and validation that if you are confused by this ever unwieldy acronym, I'm going to say, absolutely, that was exactly what I would expect. Now, it's not that helpful, <laughs> so my job is to demystify this a bit. Um, I guess what I want to, to ask folks is, are there any terms up here that you immediately think, I have no idea what that is? And all I need is some nodding or showing, yeah. People are like, I, I just don't know what that is. Do you feel like you know where to find out? No. That would be my point. I think part of the problem we've run into is we've, we've got something, and I say we as kind of a global cultural we, not just a, one group of people have come up with this and this is happening now, but we as a culture have done a bad service around telling people what we expect from you, of course, is to be good and culturally competent, but part of that is being, obviously, we also need to be socially polite, don't do anything rude, don't hurt anybody's feelings, and by the way, just know this stuff. Good. All set. Not at all. Let's muddle it further. Now I'm just bringing up gender identities. So if you were living in the world of boy and girl and man and woman, I am sorry. This is my apology time because I'm about to have your brain just kind of explode. And I'm probably not gonna put it all back together in the amount of time I have today. And in a way, I'm okay with that. Not because I just wanna make you uncomfortable for you know, joy's sake, 
but because I want to make sure that you understand that this is the culture that we are living in, and I don't believe, folks, we are not going back. So if there was sort of a hope that maybe, just maybe, <laughs> at some point everybody would just agree again that we have a two-part system, I don't see it happening. And, and it's not because this is new. It's because there's an evolution around awareness that's coming in the younger generations and a dissatisfaction with reductionist thinking, and they are on a tear. And they're not wrong. I, I'm enjoying the first of your four-way test. Is it the truth? The first time I just saw that, I thought, boy, that really just captures this nicely. Whose truth are we talking about? So when I brought in something, in a lot of groups I speak in, I, I hold this up and people go, what do you got there? And I'm like, this is a newspaper. I'm feeling a little bit more confident there might be a few people in the room who know exactly what this is. Um, I like it. It shows up at my house every day. Um, this one's from 2014. The reason I brought it in, it's the Denver Post. On the front page, it said, not just male, female anymore, Facebook gender options, there are 56. So... Two to 56, that's why I made this slide. Feels like we're in some kind of land of I don't know what's happening. I bring up the big top as sort of a metaphorical example, honestly, because I can't think of a more sort of fanciful and chaotic environment than something happening under a big top. There's like things happening over here and spinning plates and animals and noises, and, and I think in general, that's my way of capturing how most of us feel as this gender term proliferation continues. And as we don't understand the difference between sexual orientation identities and gender identities and why is it all mashed together and are they really different and I don't know where I am anymore and I'm not sure my own identity and what's happening and it makes us all want to curl under the table and just say, I'll see you later. So maybe this is something that is a little bit more familiar. Um, for those of you who can't see the comic, it's just a little, it's a little psychologist funny. It says, mom, dad. I think I may be bipedal. This is what, this is what shrinks do for humor, so apologies, it's, it's not great. Um, <laughs> this is the world that we have been living in. I call this a taxonomy of gender, so I like to use science language. There's two boxes, everybody goes in a box, there's no middle ground, you don't choose and nobody changes. This is not my idea, this came from an activist named Ricky Ann Wilchins, who called this the gender regime. I subcategorize this, I said, this is sociocultural categorization, but it's also regulated homogeneity. In other words, we've made a system of gender to accommodate ourselves. Now, some of you may be thinking, no, we didn't. We're basing this on biological sex. Okay, fair. I'm going to get there. But briefly, I just want to bring up the definition of a regime because I do think it fits nicely. This is a system that helps us ostensibly make sense of the world. So definition of a regime, a regular pattern of occurrence or action as a, as a seasonal rainfall. Now here in Colorado, that probably doesn't make any sense because what, what's the season for rain anymore? I, I find it's every day or no days or it's last year but not this year or maybe we'll have you know, winter in the middle of May and it's hard to say. I grew up in Denver. I'm getting used to it. Maybe we don't have a, a weather regime here. I also like the definition in a characteristic behavior or orderly procedure of a natural phenomenon or process. I think that's where we got stuck. We have absolutely believed that we have on our hands a natural order when we to subscribe to the gender regime. Here's the problem. Gender is not a very simplistic variable. It's actually made up of three parts. It's probably about as easy as I can make it. So, we have our social category of gender. We have gender identity, which is sort of like, who am I in inside? How do I think of myself? And then we have this thing called gender expression, which is what I show you. Now, most of us expect that all these things should pretty well go together. But when everything breaks down, sometimes gender expression doesn't match identity, and identity doesn't match our expectation of what should be. So I offer to you that any of us, our gendered self is that little bitty slice that's located at the intersection of these ideas. Now when I say social gender currency, this is my nomenclature for what I'm giving you has different value depending on what you see or experience of me or anyone else. My best example is if I'm standing before you but I had a very full beard, I know you're going to use your imagination here, just like really, 
just, just think like big Santa Claus style, massive beard. But I'm wearing my very best prom dress from 1996. How are you gonna gender me? What will your brain tell you about who I am? Don't be shy. I heard man. Now, I gave you two really strong gender expressive pieces. Beard, dress. But in the order of thought, exactly, I always I appreciate brave souls. Your brain's gonna say more currency on the beard than the dress. Therefore, man in a dress. Your brain has to make reductionistic sense of what's happening. So things are not created equally. Probably my favorite is, I dress like this quite frequently, and then I get up here and I tell people I'm female, I identify as a woman, and people are like, yeah, but you're rocking kind of a masculine style, and I'm like, I know. And often, when I'm in a bathroom, people look at me like two or three times because they're not sure I'm in the right place, and I'm not sure if they're concerned for me or for them or for everybody, or they're just like, you're not playing by the rules. <laughs> so, <laughs> I wanted to draw some attention to the way we think. Um, I just picked a slide that I thought captured this the best. So here's the scientific method. I'm a scientist. We basically are supposed to ask a question, do some research, get a hypothesis going, test it out, analyze, get to our results, right? Like this is a good way to kind of make sure that whatever I report to you is this thing called the truth. So here's a lot of what we do in gender. I want to direct your attention down here to pseudoscience. We start at the same place, I have an idea. So just think about you're gendering a child. You're like, I'm trying to figure out who this person is. We go, okay, well, I'm pretty sure that it's going to be this or it's gonna be that, so what I should do is test that. Okay, well, if my child comes to me later and says, guess what, that gender you gave me does not fit for me. Ooh, so I hit a negative. Maybe I can find a way to rationalize that back through my head and come to the same conclusion anyway. Because you know what, changing that is uncomfortable. And maybe, you know, if I go through enough checks around this and it's not working out for me, I can just use my own confirmation bias, which is returning to what I believe, and just say, no, I'm not listening to you, I think what I think. So this is where we often get stuck. We, we think that we're doing something that's very informed by data, but here's what we're actually doing. So in general, most of us know this, when did you receive your gender? It was proclaimed to you. When was it proclaimed? Birth, right? Now anymore, with the advent of scientific advancement, there are now generations of people that are like, well, I'm pretty sure that my parents knew before I was born. I can't think of a single aspect of identity that we really concentrate on so wholeheartedly that informs so much of who we are in living as gender, and we believe that we know what it is before somebody even arrives. So what do we basically do? I mean, what are folks basing the gender on? When you say it's a boy in the delivery room, how did we decide that? Was it the scientific method? I gave it to you right there, right? We observed, I mean, as college students have often said to me, you observe the bits, and then you said, here's what's up, and then we all went on. And basically, once we've assigned the gender, we differentially do this thing of nurturing and socializing and teaching, and then we expect what we call a cisgender outcome, which is a, well, it's, a it's defined as gender congruence, but in a, an assigned way. In other words, if you tell somebody they're a girl, and they grow up and they feel like a girl, and that all fits very nicely, we would call that cisgender, the root word cis being same side. Okay, so we're speaking about a word that works for being gender conforming, but, Gender variance exists, and here's the very basic premise. If there's nothing else you walk away from with this talk, is I just hope you'll walk away with this. Your sex, which by the way is not just made up of your bits, technically from a scientific angle, this is also your chromosomes, this is your, your relative hormone levels, it's all of these things put together, and that is not the same thing as your experience of yourself. If it feels like it is, you are probably cisgender, and you probably never questioned this a day in your life. But I'd offer to you that I'm imagining each and every one of you, because all of us have a gender identity that was given to us, have at some point or another felt the constraint of the box we were put in. And what I mean by that 
is on some level you were told at different points in your life that certain behaviors were not for you, interests were not for you, certain clothing was not for you, that you shouldn't be friends with certain people, and there are certain ways you should pair when it came to relationships. There were rules. If the rules fit well enough, we don't tend to get upset. So I like to always put myself on the stage because that's a good thing. These are pictures of me. Um, it's just, you know, prime time for embarrassment. Um, yeah, I do like the R2-D2 underoos, so I gotta admit, I kinda wish they had those, like at least the tank top now. Um, I wasn't what you would call a gender non-conforming individual, and you probably, that probably is not a shock to you today. <laughs> but I think this captures about right here. That's a Miss Piggy sort of ice skating embroidered sweatshirt. Um, my facial expression pretty well says it all. Why would I even bring that up? Because there are certain things that gender is completely 100% resting on. And this is where my life sort of collided with what I do professionally. I'm in the land, and psychologists, the same with medical providers and people that care for people's health, we're concerned with not doing any harm. That's actually one of our very first tenets. Ideally, we want to do good, but we first and foremost want to avoid harm. And part of the way that we do that is by trying to honor who people are and understand them through a developmental lens. So part of the, the conundrum here for us is that when we have a taxonomy of gender that says you're either this or that, and somebody comes to me and says that doesn't fit for me, and I argue, and I deny, and I say no, that's the way it is, I'm gonna tell you right now, I've already taken a step right off the ledge of doing harm. Because in a very basic way, in childhood, I just, this obviously isn't everything that happens in development, but one of the first things is just, children are most concerned about the possibility of rejection and shaming. And I would offer you that any of us in our developmental trajectory of just being a human being are concerned with this our whole life long. But when we're small, this is the thing we're concerned with the most. This is a basic need. And if anything jeopardizes that, it's a pretty scary proposition. So it's an interesting thing, when we actually talk about gender different children or transgender children, children who identify as a gender other than they were assigned, it's pretty remarkable. Those who come out very early and disclose this to us, because there's such a grand risk. And it's no wonder why people kind of get confused with, well, if somebody hasn't told us by the time they're, you know, 18 months to two years, or they haven't shown us their gender, I mean, and they, they tell me at 15, 17, 20, 25, 30, 50, how can I know it's true? And all I would offer to you is, if somebody tells you it's true, who are you to say it's not? And there's a lot of things working against that piece of, hmm, disclosing authentically, because we're worried about what may happen. So sometimes this happens. You have a kiddo that starts out pretty much saying, this is me, I'm gonna rock this out without the rules, and then picks up on the rules. <laughs> so I call this the gender conforming years. If you're missing it, I'm in the lower left-hand corner, I've got a massive perm. Um, these are, I was really proud of that hair, that was some big hair. Um, and in the bottom there, I, I did this little run around in the debutante years. I can pull gender conformity like nobody's business. <laughs> I can give you gender currency that absolutely will tell you you should treat me as a girl and that will not authentically be my gender identity inside because the way I consider myself is much more complicated than everybody else's vision of what a woman may be. And honestly, for folks, the, the truth is, Society let me know I was basically not getting this whole thing. Um, I had the long hair, I had the earrings, and I was still being told I was in the wrong bathroom, so I finally gave up. Because there was something going on that even I wasn't catching. So when we move into tasks of adolescence and things around further, like social acceptance, and we have the wonderful world of romantic orientation and all of these things, you can see the stakes just get higher and higher and higher as far as telling people who we are. Very basically, if I also had to boil this down to making this as simple as I can, this is kind of what we do with gender identity. It's made up of four components. There's nature, or what we consider to be there from the beginning. There's nurture, what we do with that. The culture around us, and then development, time. 
Most of the time when I'm talking to folks and, and there's some confusion around, well, I don't understand how this is a thing. I mean, like, if kids are telling me they're a gender other than I told them they were, like, I, no, I, just, I don't understand how that's even happening. And, and furthermore, I'm not going to call them by the pronouns they're asking me to call them, and I'm not going to call them by a new name because I don't want to cause it. I don't want to encourage it. Really quickly, just some basic probability. Even if I take all four of these things and I give them equal value, how many of these do we have complete control over? What do we have the most control over? Nurture. So even if we thought about this in terms of whether we as a society sort of make people the gender they are, we've got influence in one quadrant. And after that, we have a collective influence, but it's not in our immediate control in culture. We don't control the wiring and disposition of the people as they arrive on the earth, and we certainly don't control time. Um, so the only reason I sort of bring this slide to bear on things is <laughs> in our two-party system, um, a lot of people will be like, yeah, but we've sort of built everything around this notion. I mean, like pink and blue. A anybody have a sense of when the whole pink and blue division came on the scene around gender? Like when you started going for that baby shower gift and they told you, well, you went in there and usually they say, well, what are they having? And I always like to mess with people, so I'm like, a baby. <laughs> but typically, if you said a girl, they directed you to all the pink items. The boy, they directed you to the blue items. You know what's interesting to me is when you look at this up in the history of pink and blue and you go back, this, temp this template the way it is didn't show up until 1940, and it was because they marketed it that way. And previous to that, they actually marketed pink for boys and blue for girls because pink was a stronger color, and it was therefore more suitable for the boy, and blue was dainty and delicate. It's amazing what we can do with revisionist history, and we can think something has been that way all along. Um, there's a few things I'm probably not going to have a tremendous amount of time to go into. This is just a case that if you're interested, when it came to thinking about, well, wait a minute, isn't gender something we cause, yet again, we actually had a scientific, I mean, if we want to go back to that inquiry, that scientific inquiry, we had a case, identical twin males. They were both born genetically male, and one of them had a botched circumcision, and therefore, they told the parents to raise the child as a girl. And they said, don't worry, science tells us that will cause your child to be a girl. I think we always just like to feel like we're more powerful than we really are. Um, and what happened, of course, was the child never felt appropriate, and as time went on, when they finally did find out that they were actually born male, they did their best job to transition physically back to being a man in society. This does not end with a happy story. Both brothers took their lives for different reasons. But I think what you can see is that the, the stakes are high, and they're so high that really we only needed a sample size of one to decide that this was not the way things worked. Um, so. I'm going to kind of start wrapping up, because <laughs> I'm looking at the time. And I could go on. You probably have noticed I'm a little loquacious. Um, one of the things I think that's probably the most challenging about this arena is the notion that somehow sexual orientation and gender identity are related, but they're actually conceptually separate. And I probably can do no better thing to illustrate this than to very briefly just ask you to tell me what my sexual orientation is. I'm really inviting you to tell me exactly what you think and not your really polite self. I want that brain that all it's doing is categorically, categorically trying to make sense of the world. I just want you to tell me what it actually, I mean, I got up here, you even saw my picture. What did it just go bleh and tell you about me? Any takers? Okay, bisexual? Anyone here think I'm straight? There's like one hand in the back. <laughs> like one. Anybody think I might be gay? Mm -hmm, the hands are good. People are reticent. People are like, I am not participating. Um, well, well, here's the thing. I have, a, I, I have a notion. I'm pretty sure the majority of you think I'm gay. And by the way, you're correct. And you want to know the reason why I know that is because I think you've looked at me, and in my gender nonconformity, you have decided that this signal tells you gay. And because you're correct, your brain is more likely to use that exact same tool again. 
And I'll tell you who you can't see. That girl that was in that dress sitting on that bench on that earlier slide, you wouldn't think she's gay. She's giving you different gender signals, and we've conflated the two. We do this all the time. Sex, gender, we call them the same thing. Gender, sexual orientation, we think they're the same thing. I'm going to tell you again, it is not your fault. The world we live in is absolutely based on gender regime rules of telling us what's true and where to go and how to be. And it's meant to be that way because it's going to make life simpler. It's not your fault that your brain does that. The point I make is that when you see a sign like this, I'm going to guess even when you see mermaids and pirates, chances are you still know what that room is for. So I usually end by saying, what are we so afraid of? What is the discomfort of upending a regime that limits people's ability to tell you who they are? I know it makes people uncomfortable. It disorders our neat categorization and the way we, things, we thought things were. But I can tell you this is gentler, it is kinder, and it leaves room for everybody. And not only that, folks, it's true. So, thank you. I totally exceeded my time. Sarah? Yes. Hi, Sarah. Hi. I am so impressed. I wish I had known you when I was a counselor in high school. These are issues that are there all of the time. Yes. And there just isn't a way to, to know, and no matter how much we try. So I appreciate very, very much what you bring to us, and thank you. And my responsibility today is one that I don't appreciate sometimes and others do because they interrupt, you know, or have to, it has to stop to say this. But those of us who are part of this organization, Rotary, which I've been told is the largest humanitarian organization mm -hmm. in the world, so we here want to honor you very, very much with a donation of 100 doses of vaccine. Oh, wow. In, in your name. And I know, I'm sure I'm speaking for people here, but certainly from me, I'm very, very grateful for you. Thank you for coming and being with Thank us. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's amazing. Absolutely. My pleasure.